Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend, I'm with eLearning Brothers. Today's session is going to be about unlocking the potential of responsive design. This session will be recorded and we'll get a copy of it sent out to all who have registered for the session. If you have questions, comments, or would like to participate uh, with the session, please do use the questions panel. It looks like some of you have already found that. So do please continue to use that questions panel and uh, we'll try to get to all of your comments and questions that we can. If you do have questions that we're not able to answer uh, live, we'll try to take those questions offline and get those answered after, after the session. All right, so to talk to us about responsive design, we have Chris Van Wingerden. Did I say that right this time? I, I've been practicing. He's a senior <laughs> VP of Learning Solutions at Domino. Thanks for your time, Chris, and I'll go ahead and just turn the time over to you. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, Andrew, and bang on. Way to go on that one. The practice paid off. <laughs> perfect uh, example of how practice makes perfect in our in our e-learning world. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, well, we'll get ourselves rolling here, gang. Um, unlocking the potential of responsive design. Well, let me maybe start what we're doing, talking about here today by just explaining a little bit um, of, uh, of what we do and when, where we're coming from, because it's actually pretty integral to the story that, uh, that I've got to share here with you today. Uh, Domino, uh, we make a, a tool called Domino One. Uh, it's an authoring platform for e-learning content, mobile learning content, job aids, all kinds of things. And um, the first version of our tool came out in 2002. And of course, like anything, it goes through multiple iterations as time goes on. Um, and about three years ago, we officially released um, and added in an option for creating responsive design content uh, within the tool. We'd always been a fairly traditional e-learning tool coming out of, I describe it as the PowerPoint heritage, and we'll talk about that kind of idea a fair bit as we go along here. Um, but suddenly, our, our team had presented us with a, an opportunity to make content in a, in a whole new way. Um, and what I found leading up to the release of, of, uh, of the flow authoring option, the responsive design option, was that I really actually had a period of struggle, a period of um, having to unlearn things that I knew already based on working in, a, in one particular way to be able to understand and take advantage of how to work in uh, this new medium, really, of, of responsive design um, and the, the changes that it brings forward in the way that you think. But once I got past that, um, it, I, you know, classic light bulb moment, ping, the, uh, the light bulb went on and I went, wow, if I think a little differently, I learn uh, how to do this um, thing called responsive design, it opens up a lot more um, avenues for me for creating uh, great learning opportunities for, for our clients and for uh, our clients to then help their own uh, organizations as well. So um, that's a kind of the nutshell version of, of what we're going to do today is we're going to, I'm going to take you through some of the background of, of why that was a, a challenge and a difference for me to start thinking differently, et cetera, and, uh, and share some ideas. And then also hopefully give you a glimpse into why it ends up being a very uh, cool thing to actually uh, to undergo and to, to shift over to thinking uh, in a responsive design fashion. Uh, before we do that, quick pause, um, another self-promotion. Uh, my colleague Brent Schlenker here at Domino, uh, he and I run a podcast every Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern live on the Crowdcast tool called Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee, hashtag idiotic. Um, and we would welcome you to join us up, uh, on that at any time. It's also available in all the usual uh, podcasting locations, uh, the iTunes Store, Google Play, uh, Spotify, etc. The audio versions of that, plus the recordings are all available on Crowdcast as well. It's non, um, it's non-tool specific. It's about broader uh, e-learning and uh, learning and development topics, um, all kinds of things. Something for everybody every week, and usually a, a separate guest every week, different topic, etc. So. Well, I welcome you to join us for, for those sessions or catching the recordings as well. And hopefully you find that valuable and helpful for, uh, for the work that you're doing in the L&D space. All right, so uh, Andrew, if we could, let's pop up uh, the first poll question there. Let's, uh, let's kick it off with, uh, with hearing a little bit from the folks who are joining us here today. Sure, so there it is up on the screen. How much of your learning development is currently designed for use on a mobile device? Um, those responses are already coming in, but uh, those options are none, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. Um, as just a, a early looking at this, I'm very interested at how many people is 100%. There's a lot of mobile users here in our audience. Um, I'll give you guys about three more seconds to poll and participate. You can click right on the screen for that. 
And here's those results. So I'll share those up on the screen. So 58% of our audience, the vast majority, said none. Uh, 20, 25%. Oh man, this is gonna be hard. Lots of percents. Okay, 18% <laughs> of the audience said 25%. 12% said 100. So yeah, I mean, there's quite a spectrum, but the vast majority are definitely none. Yeah, none or, or, or minimal right now. So, and that's that's cool to know. That really does help me understand who's who's joining us here today and, and some of the things that might have you um, interested. And uh, part of our conversation here today, we'll, we'll start to consider, you know, whether this is actually something that uh, that's relevant for you and you should be thinking about. So very cool. Thanks for throwing that up there. All right. So I, I want to go back in time a little bit. Um, when we first got given this amazing thing called the internet, uh, and particularly the, the you know the World Wide Web, being able to surf the internet um, in a browser, what the web design world did was we we basically had uh, we took the things that we already did for designing other kinds of visual communications and kind of applied them then to this new medium that we that we've been given. So. You know, for more than 500 years, uh, we've been making uh, things for, for, for the print medium and, uh, you know, going back to Gutenberg and the printing press. And we took that into the computerized world uh, in the early 80s with the creation of PageMaker so that we could make print things better but designing them on the computer. So it seems like just a, a sensible thing then to go and take that same kind of design approach um, and then start putting it actually on the screen when the screen itself becomes our uh, medium of communication. Just gonna slip a couple of things around. I got too many things in my way. Um, so, you know, there are some, some key things to, to think about with the printing world. Uh, in the printing world, you always know how big your page is. Um, if it's a newspaper, you're maybe designing for a, an older style broadsheet, which is a big page, or a, a tabloid, or it's a magazine with, with fixed pages, um, or maybe it's a poster or a billboard, but you've always got a known size that you're targeting. And that's what uh, really constrains and or empowers your, your, your design approach. Um, it also means that in that kind of a model, um, you have a lot of control. You can put something exactly here, uh, you know, in the bottom corner. Uh, a lot of the visual tools that we have, Photoshop, et cetera, have actual X and Y coordinates. You can put something at an exact pixel location, and you know that that's going to be there um, when you then move out into the print world. Um, and it also meant that that's how we designed our, our websites, was in this model of putting things in the exact place where we wanted them to go. Because we took the idea of the fixed size of a printed page and just said, hey, we have a screen and it's got a width and a height, and that's now our page size. So it might have been 800 by 600 in the early days, and, uh, and then the, you know, the shouts of, of, of yay when we all got to move up to bigger monitors, 1024 by you know, 768 becoming a new, newer standard, for example. Um, so we took the idea, the things that we, we took the design models, the ways of thinking that we had uh, from other media and applied them then to this new media. Um, and it really did work. It worked pretty well for, for quite a period of time. Um, the problem was some new things then, you know, come along in particular, uh, you know, the rise of the smartphone. Um, and now we have something different. The, it's got a different page size, um, especially if you're holding your smartphone vertically and looking at it. So, you know, what do we do? Well, um, the web design world initially said, well, we'll just make a, a new page. When someone comes to our website, we'll, we'll detect that they've got a smartphone. And then we're going to make a new page, give them, uh, we're going to route them, I should say, to a new version of our website that's designed for that size of a page. So you might have had a, a fairly traditional old school, you know, website like this if you were, that would see if you were on your monitor, uh, at your computer, at your desk. Uh, but if you actually were going to it on your smartphone, they would actually show you maybe uh, a page that looked more like this. And part of this process at the time, as well as was making decisions that um, maybe people on a smartphone didn't need everything that's on the website. They're just looking for something probably quickly. Or, uh, and so um, a lot of the times the mobile page that you would get was actually led with a fairly simplified menu um, uh, and could be in fact quite a bit of a different experience uh, compared to um, what you would be encountering on the desktop per se. Uh, which was, which, which was a, this was a suitable, um, and at least initially a suitable way to you know to approach this we've got horizontal screens and we've got little vertical screens for our smartphones and we'll give people two different uh, 
two different uh, versions of, of content when they come to our website. Let's pop another poll there, though, uh, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind, and we'll uh, we'll just check in with our with the folks on our audience here on another question. Sure. How many devices do you use to access the internet in a typical day? Again, you can click right on the screen. As I was preparing this poll, I was remembering how many uh, smart home devices I have. Um, unbelievable. Well, and you know what? That I was thinking about that as I was uh, as we were prepping for this yesterday too. I was thinking, yeah, actually, the number is probably even more than we suspect now because of the number of things that do actually talk to the internet without us thinking that they're that we're actually using them. So right. actually, here's those results I, from the poll. There's 44% say two, 42% say three. 9% said four, 5% said more than four, nobody said one. Exactly. Yeah, um, that's kind of the fact of life right now, isn't it? That uh, that we, we've we always got screens handy. And truthfully, we're probably doing it you know, a couple at a time, right? We might uh, be sitting in front of our computer, but we're still grabbing our phone to do other tasks. Uh, we might be watching television and we've still got a tablet on our laps because we're you know catching up on blogs or news or Facebook or whatever while the other screen is, is running something else for us. So uh, not just uh, how many different devices, but even you know, simultaneously different devices, et cetera. So, um, so you know, the recognition of this fact um, ties very much into uh, then you know, the thought processes that were going through the minds of the, the web design world um, as they tried to, wrap, to, to wrestle with this, with this idea. Um, because the arrival of more than just sort of two standard screens also meant that um, the screen ratios, the display uh, dimensions in the sense of, of what we would have considered a web page uh, potentially change. You have, um, you know, tablets that are four to three ratio typically, widescreen TV 16 to nine ratio. Uh, a lot of smartphones held vertically are nine to 16, but if you flip it on its side, it's suddenly a 16 by nine, uh, 16 to nine ratio as well. So, um, the model for, uh, for that the initial model that the web design world used for creating, say, a second version of a website that they would flip you to if you were on a smartphone, um, becomes a practical, uh, a very uh, challenge to a, a very strong challenge to try and deal with. You you really can't end up making four, five, seven different versions of your website and uh, constantly maintain them, keep them updated, um, keep them consistent, not overlook things. The the opportunity for error in that way uh, becomes really tremendous. And it's just so complicated to try to track and, and keep uh, all of this uh, you know, in mind as you're working on a, uh, a website. So the, the web design world arrived at this idea called responsive web design. Um, and it's a dramatically different way of designing, planning, um, and even structuring the content in a web page to be able to address the problem of um, you know, the sheer variety of devices and screens in particular that uh, that we might be using to access the internet these days. Before we push a little further along the actual re uh, responsive web design aspect of things, I, I want to just kind of bring us back to um, to the e-learning world because we've, we've done a similar path um, that the web design world did um, by, you know, adapting what we're doing um, to be able to deliver content over the internet. So. Um, you know, for the longest time, uh, a, class board, uh, a classroom would have a, a chalkboard at the front that the teacher could do something on to give us uh, notes or highlights or, or information. And gosh, a technological improvement came with the, uh, the overhead projector um, and, and transparencies. And then in the 80s, we took that same idea and it became PowerPoint. Uh, to be able to do presentations, you know, that were created on a computer and then delivered from the computer onto that screen in the front of the uh, in the front of the room, and then we we largely took this same idea and then called it e-learning by making it something that um, it's something that people would actually run and do on their own, and by you know we might have more interaction than a PowerPoint projected on the wall, etc. But we were largely moving that idea of a lecture model supported by you know a visual. Um, forward into the earliest ideas that we had for, for e-learning. And a lot of us still do something, you know, that and work in tools that are very much uh, from the PowerPoint heritage. A good indication is the fact that we can import PowerPoint to get started in a lot of tools, um, which is very true for our own Claro authoring option uh, within the Domino One platform. So, 
So whether it's the early web design approach where you'd mock up a website in Photoshop um, and then you would hand that over and, the, and your dev team would build the website based on everything being sort of chopped up from the, from the, the, power, for, from the Photoshop files um, or the model of e-learning using say PowerPoint and PowerPoint to related tools. Um, the way that that kind of a tool typically works, um, uh, this kind of flannel board from kindergarten is maybe a good metaphor. We have, um, you have a, a fixed dimension. So the kind of like the printing of a page, right? You've got the, the, the length and, and uh, the width and the height of the, uh, of the content. And you've also then got uh, the idea of layers. So in the case of this flannel board, the back layer is this blue sky, and then the green is another layer of felt. And then on top of that, we have the logs, and then there's the yellow part of the flame and the red part of the flame. We know this in PowerPoint, we can uh, send things to the back, we can bring things forward, et cetera. And uh, all these things that we don't like where the fire is, we can pick it up and we can move it over a little bit. And that's, an, uh, you know, makes it a, a, a pixel perfect representation then of, of exactly what it is we want to show people and, and display for people. So the idea of you know, working in a box, of working in a fixed set of dimensions, um, and then layering content, um, that was inherent for both uh, the early web design world and the and the early, and the e-learning world. Those are sort of the nature of how a page is structured uh, for both of those uh, both of those design opportunities. Um, re responsive web design is a lot different than that, um, and may, I find it's kind of helpful often to talk about first of all maybe you know what responsive web design isn't. Um, responsive web design isn't just shrinking. We're not taking the um, the same size of something and just making it smaller on a smaller screen or uh, bigger on a bigger screen, the way that PowerPoint would get bigger if you project it versus um, just having it on your, on your laptop screen, for example. Um, and the reason is that if that's not a real practical opportunity uh, to give people, especially on a smaller device. Um, you know, originally we were enamored by the zooming in because you could pinch and, and, and squeeze, et cetera, to zoom in and zoom out. Um, but that becomes kind of annoying <laughs> in a hurry, a challenging way to encounter the content. Um, so responsive design isn't just making something bigger or smaller uh, on, a, on a different screen. It's also not making multiple versions of the same page. The very problem that, it, in fact, responsive design is trying to solve is to not have to make multiple versions of, of the same content page to eliminate the need for us to maintain the uh, multiple versions. Uh, we really are trying to make one page um, that can that can solve this problem. The the early thinkers, uh, the designers behind the idea of responsive web design, um, came up with the idea that responsive web design is so different, but it's actually the way that the internet works. We're used to so much now on mobile devices, um, apps and such that, uh, that take us maybe down scrolling, your Twitter feed, your Facebook feed, et cetera. Um, the flexibility of that, kind of, uh, of that kind of content presentation is, is really just um, a native way for the, for the web to be able to work. The, um, the original coiner of the phrase responsive web design was a gentleman named Ethan Marcotte. Um, and he put these, his initial thoughts together in an article in a magazine called A List Apart. It's a web design uh, magazine, really um, sometimes very technical for web designers, but also um, I'm not a web designer, but I enjoy going to it and checking out things because not everything applies to me. Some of it's a bit arcane from, from where I come from, but also a lot of really good stuff just about best practices in web design, et cetera, which uh, those of us in the e-learning space really can benefit from as well. Um, back in 2010 already, uh, this article appeared and Marcotte outlined a few things about how we could use some of the things that web pages can actually do already, could do this at the time, but using those tools differently to then create a different kind of a page structure. And he identified a couple of things. So basically what he's saying is, how can we make a page that can actually adapt to different display uh, sizes, to different display ports, basically? Um, and he identified two key things. The first being that the thinking of the structure of a page, not as a box with layers of things, but instead as uh, kind of a panel that is laid out as a table or the technical term he used was a fluid grid. 
Um, and we'll come back to that in a heartbeat. The other thing was this idea of media queries. We already had the ability for a page, uh, web page when it's opening to do a little check and say, what am I opening in? You know, how big is the browser that I'm opening in? Um, by using the, the, those two ideas in combination, you can actually build a page that has intelligence uh, to be able to do changes and adapt, adaptations uh, as the content uh, is loading. Or even on a smaller device, as you rotate it, you can actually see the changes as the browser, as the content says, oh, we changed our width, let's do something different. So a couple of different metaphors, moving us away from that flannel board then. Um, and the first is the idea of the fluid grid. The, these tile puzzles, I'm of a generation that uh, remembers getting these little tile puzzles, for instance, in the, uh, in the cereal box. And the idea is that each of these tiles is uh, all in the same sort of level. They're all at the same kind of layer level, if you want to think about it that way. And they slide around each other. They're connected. They're almost on rails. And they move around and they can move into uh, the empty space um, that's available to them. Um, to extend this further, you could think of the, the dimensions of this tile puzzle, though, as something that you can play with, and things will shrink and expand. So maybe give it a sense of, of elasticity uh, to it, and that gives you a sense of how the page is structured in responsive design. Um, the second thing that, that Mark had identified were media queries. Um, the idea of having the browser, uh, having the page know what size the browser was at, and therefore using that to tell the fluid grid how to arrange itself. So you might have a page that, um, you know, no matter when it loads, uh, it, it's going to be able to do different things. The page that, example that we're looking at here, for wider pages, it's kind of two columns, a left and right half. But then when it gets down to the skinnier page, it just simply becomes um, a one column display of information because trying to keep two columns on a skinny page, like say a smartphone held vertically, uh, doesn't make much sense. The other thing that this is illustrating is that as the handle sort of gets dragged out on the side there, this is um, th these changes can happen almost on a pixel by pixel basis. So we really don't have to worry anymore about the exact size of a screen. Um, it's the page uh, in a responsive project is gonna be able to respond and change no matter what it is. We're not having to say, be exactly this or this. We're saying within a range of X to Y widths, do this. Um, and it really future proofs our content moving forward. So um, the basic idea of, of responsive web design is that we can create content that will adapt or match or morph uh, to match the container that we're putting it in. The old way of creating web-based content was really like making a block of ice. We'd have a glass and if we froze the water in the glass, well, that, the, the frozen water, the ice only has the shape for that one particular glass and it's not very suitable or easy nor sensible to try to put it into um, another container. It just doesn't fit. Whereas a responsive web design page is actually water. It's fluid, it's, uh, it's liquid. You put it into a container of a particular size and shape, it will adapt to not match that shape. Bigger or smaller, it, will, uh, it can change and adapt, et cetera. So you're, you're working in a medium that um, is not hard, it's not rigid, it's fluid, and it's going to, to morph and change. And that's actually, that's its key power. Um, and then also becomes then a key sort of design strength of thinking about how to work within uh, this design model. So, so what does this look like? Well, let's take an example of uh, responsive, take a look at responsive design in the real world. Uh, one of the first projects where Ethan Marcotte applied this stuff that, uh, that he'd been thinking about was to the Boston Globe's website. And although in the past couple of months it's gone on, undergone a bit of a visual revision, it still does the things that, uh, that he'd originally set it up to do. So I'm gonna flip over to, there's the Boston Globe website. Um, so what are we looking at here? Remember that concept of the fluid grid. So you can see there's an area across the top, and then on this page, there's kind of three columns. There's stuff over here on the right side, there's stuff down the center, and then there's stuff on the left side. And you get that idea of the grid because you can see dividing lines over here, for instance. So that tile puzzle, you kind of get the sense that each of these is kind of a tile uh, within the grid. Now, the grid's kind of elastic, so if I grab the edge of this browser and I make it skinnier, you'll see that things change. It might just be simply that um, text might move down, so it's kind of subtle, but if I go a little wider here, 
the word two in this headline, well, when this column gets skinny, uh, skinnier, then it drops down to, to the next column down. For example, you can see, you know, the different, well, now in that same column over here, we've gone from four lines to five lines of text because there isn't enough width, so it's bumped itself down. Now, some major things are going to happen. We just lost, for example, this skinny subcolumn in here. It disappeared on us. Um, if we keep going skinnier and skinnier, now we've lost that other third column. Now, nothing's actually, I use the word lost, but we haven't lost them. They've just been relocated to be down at the bottom of the page. So one of the core ideas uh, you know, with responsive design is that we're not taking things away from the learner. We're just reorganizing them to be better accessible uh, based on, say, our priority levels that we perceive, or the information hierarchy that we're trying to represent. Let's go a little skinnier here. There we go. So now we're down to just a single column taking us down through the content. Um, and as we've adjusted those columns, they've also resulted that the page has gotten way, way longer. You know, we used to have a, a mantra in the e-learning world and the web design world that, you know, scrolling was bad. But scrolling is, with the arrival of mobile devices, scrolling has become basically a, a, a default way to navigate content. Nobody's really bothered by scrolling anymore. Um, so as the page changes and adjusts, it just gets longer and longer because more stuff has to move down. I sometimes uh, describe what responsive design is doing is it's kind of like, more like working in a Word document than working in a PowerPoint file. If you've got three pages in a Word doc, um, it's all text, and you decide in the middle of page two to add an image. So you're going to click in, insert the image, boom. Well, the text that's after that insert point, it just gets shoved down below the image and the document might now actually be onto the fourth page instead of just being three pages. And so it's gotten longer. Um, so in some ways, working in responsive design is kind of like working more like in Word than it is working um, in PowerPoint. Let's swing that back out to the, to the full width there. So, so the, 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 Globe, the Boston Globe website is a really good illustration of that fluid grid. Um, because it kind of, well, it really is kind of built into this box visual too, and it really supports that idea very, very nicely. Ultimately, um, as uh, the web design world picked up on the, the ideas of, of responsive web design and started taking it further, it also then ended up changing and giving a whole new visual design language uh, to websites as well. You have things like very common things like a large graphic at the top of a page called uh, referred to in web design world as a hero image. And if you scroll down, maybe the parts move at different speeds, what we call the parallax effect to give the page a sense of, of dimension and of, uh, you know, just greater visual interest, for example. Um, you see a lot of use of content carousels. In this case, you can see the little two dots. So that's a visual indicator that if I click, more stuff will slide in for me than, than is initially on the screen. Um, or, or things like modal windows, content appearing over the main screen. You've often been to a website and you're scrolling down and you go to leave and, and it pops up a, hey, sign up for our newsletter, uh, that kind of a thing where the main part of the content is grayed out. Uh, you can still see it because there's a transparency on it, but the, you know, the message thing that they're trying to do and give you is, is, is over top of that. Um, and that's a way of solving some of the problems that that uh, that having a flatter page created uh, for us compared to say working in a in a tool like PowerPoint or the e-learning tools that came from PowerPoint, where we could create a button and we could change we could uh, you know show something on the page. You click another button that would show something different um, over the page, and we were playing with the idea of showing and hiding layers. In responsive web design, we don't have the same idea of layers um, in quite the same finite way. So things like modal windows give us opportunities to have content over top of other content and still keep it dimensionally uh, flexible in that way. So uh, ultimately, what happened for in, in the web design world is that responsive design made people think differently entirely about what a page could be, what you could do with it, what it could have. Um, and then the, and the spin, of, uh, spin off of that was that it gave new ways to help people visually communicate ideas and tell stories uh, on the web. So here, here's a couple of, um, of examples. Uh, a really nice uh, article in the BBC uh, website uh, about the, uh, the folks who carry 
uh, cocaine uh, out of the jungle to you know the uh, to the uh, uh, airports, not airports, the airfields where the smugglers will then take it out of the the jungles of Peru. Um, and then the Verge, when um, when the Apple Watch came out, it did a really neat review um, using a, a really strong visual storytelling style based in responsive design. So let's take a couple of peeks. Uh, couple of quick peeks at those. So here's that first article about the mochilleros. I know that I'm totally mangling that, by the way. Um, strong scrolling experience. So as we go down, content uh, is revealed, kind of that parallax effect that I talked about. Other content comes up. We have, you get the sense of the columns uh, or the, of the grid because there's stuff on the left and then the visual space on the right. Um, other things being triggered in their appearance as we scroll down, extra supporting information. And this one's neat because as we scroll, and I'm continuing to scroll down with my mouse here, but as I scroll, the, the map area gets revealed. Uh, more and more information gets revealed. So a really nice use there of that verticality then as a storytelling uh, opportunity. Um, and then the other one that I mentioned, the Apple Watch uh, review from TheVerge.com uh, goes back to 2015, but it remains one of my favorite examples of, uh, of this idea of uh, responsive web design giving us a new way of telling stories. So we'll do the scroll down, you know, embedding videos in different places and a visual timeline content in this case opening up both up and down we scroll through and there's actually a video in the background so the background actually got brighter there because it's using a um, it's using a video type format rather than just a static image uh, and it's a magazine so there's a lot of reading you know involved but uh, supplemental images that on the page taking us down pull quotes for you know uh, the emphasis of key points etc and then again, a background video that's actually moving as a, if I stop scrolling, it pauses. So it's the action of scrolling down that's also changing the content there in the background. So, um, so some really neat visual uh, uh, tools then, you know, that are available in, in this kind of a model for helping us convey information, uh, present it to people, et cetera. And those are really neat things that we can take advantage of then um, you know, as e-learning designers, when we start thinking about uh, this responsive design approach. There are some key things um, that are different then about the way that you plan and design things uh, in responsive design. Um, I mean, I mentioned way back at the start of our time here how, um, you know, I went through a bit of a struggle before, well, the first time our team I had an actual version of our flow authoring option that was usable by someone other than the dev team, uh, they gave it to me. They said, Chris, go in, try making some things. And I did that and I, uh, I made something and I thought, well, this isn't, this doesn't do what I want it to do. It's not working the way I, I want it to work. Um, and I vented a little bit to someone and said, mm, and, and you know, hey, this isn't, I can't do the things that, I, that, I, that I've always thought I could do in e-learning. And they said, no, keep going, keep trying, just keep, we want to see what happens when you start uh, doing this. And eventually, at some point, um, I, I probably was anyway surfing the internet and I saw something and I went, oh, and then I looked at it on my phone and went, oh, and then I tried to reproduce that experience um, in, in Flow. And for me, that there was a light bulb moment. I realized that I was trying to make this new thing um, behave, act, and work exactly the way that my old tool, uh, Claro, that I was more used to using uh, would, would create content for me. And I realized that there's ultimately, there's a new design language. It's almost, and a new grammar really. The pages are structured differently and therefore we have to take advantage of that in a different way in order to be able to create content. And there's some other things to, to think about then that change the way that you plan and design the visual aspect at least of, uh, of, of content, whether that's a website or, um, or an e-learning content piece. So, um, in responsive design, you're designing for the width of the screen. You're not designing for an iPad um, or an iPad uh, Retina or a, an iPhone 6 versus an iPhone 8. 
Um, you're designing based on the width of the screen that's going to display the content. And that's kind of a safety valve because it means that any time that that width is present or, or viewable, your content knows what to do. Whereas if you created something for specifically an iPhone 6 when it came out, the minute the iPhone 7 comes out, well, that content might actually look really bad on it uh, because it's just a little bigger now, for instance, like a 7 Plus or something. Um, and what happens is you use um, the different screen widths can be triggers then. As a, uh, if you think from the smallest size of a screen width and then get wider, you can then use um, going past what we call breakpoints, different width markers in a sense, to tell the page to do things differently. Um, depending on what you need it to do or what makes a better display experience. You also end up, and in a lot of cases, particularly for the web design world, uh, you end up designing from you know, your smallest uh, screen widths outward. So you make it look good and work uh, for, say, someone on a, on a smartphone, uh, and you've actually then probably already taken care of most of the things for a wider screen, and then all you're doing is telling it to behave a little bit differently. Um, and the reason you come from that is because it's often uh, a really easy design thing on a widescreen to put a lot of stuff and then you look at it on a small screen and you go, oh wow, I've made quite a mess of things. So starting small and then working out helps you actually, uh, helps give you a framework that makes sense uh, as you go out as opposed to having to really modify things a lot if you're trying to make something big look good down on a smaller size. Um, Stephen Hay, who created, who wrote a book called Responsive Design Workflow, uh, in the early days of responsive web design, I had a quote, expand it until it looks like four asterisks. And when it looks like four asterisks, well, then you add another breakpoint and tell it to tell the page to do something differently design wise. Design wise. A couple of other things that uh, that uh, that you start to think about um, across those different um, screen width ranges that you might have content displayed on. I've talked about the idea of having one page that can look good on all of those, but it doesn't mean that you've always got the exact same thing being presented to people um, on, on different screen devices, because sometimes things don't make sense uh, to go, uh, you know, be looking at something on a smartphone vertically versus a widescreen like a tablet or, or your computer monitor, for example. So sometimes you actually not just have to sort of rearrange the grid, but maybe you're actually thinking about what people are doing. Um, an example um, in the marketing world that I saw once was on a wider screen with someone was on a computer, there was sort of an animation through steps in a process and you could slide the slider and see them. Um, and the decision that that web team made was that they actually just made it more of a, a video um, as aspect on a smaller device so that you weren't trying to wiggle a small notched, uh, uh, wiggle your finger across a small, the small notches of a, uh, of a small timeline, for example. So um, you want to provide um, an equivalent uh, uh, experience of information, but it doesn't have to be the exact same experience that you're giving people to convey that information. Um, and as part of this, keeping things simple tends to be a, a really strong way to, to start out successfully, because it means that you can be more flexible uh, and there's less work to make things different as you go. So, that's the responsive design world um, at large. Let's bring this back then to, to the e-learning world. I've got a few examples that we'll, uh, that we'll run through of different things here. So um, I'm going to, oh, I've lost my notes. There we go. I'm going to make the screen just a little bit wider here again to get us started. And we'll, uh, we'll go through a bunch of different things here. Um, Actually, we'll reload that one. I'm on page two. I forgot that I was playing around ahead of our session. So this first sample is something that I would describe as kind of mimicking a traditional e-learning kind of experience. We have uh, the navigation. We have forward and back buttons, page counter. Uh, off to the left side, there's a menu, including an outline that you can see the structure of the content. And the, the learner is going to go through um, the content page by page. Um, as I say, kind of a typical e-learning kind of experience. Um, but if they happen to be on, say, a smartphone, what they would see is that the content is arranged, um, in the case of this section here, uh, vertically, instead of trying to make three skinny columns that ultimately look quite uh, you know, ugly, for example. So the page has morphed or changed depending on um, how wide a screen we're using to, to look at the content. Um, we can still certainly do all kinds of interactive things 
Um, I, I know I emphasize simplicity, but there's no barrier to um, being able to create, uh, you know, the same kinds of experiences. Uh, in most cases, things are very simple and applicable. I have a purpose that I, for why I'm going to uh, page four here. Um, and then the content within a page can actually also be responsive as well. So not only can this page as a whole change, but this uh, horizontal tab set, when we get down to a skinnier screen dimension, um, it can automatically turn itself from a horizontal tab set into a, uh, a vertical accordion menu for a better experience on a narrower device. So there's an awful lot of layers of intelligence that you can build into a page to do uh, to take advantage of different uh, and adapt to different screen widths that it might be viewed on. Um, another sample to, to work through. So this is a, a sample that takes the idea of a longer scrolling page, and instead of just having it uh, be a way to adapt individual pages, we, we've taken the whole lesson and put it into one longer scrolling page. So from a navigation perspective, we don't have forward and back buttons. We've got up and down. And the counter is counting the section as we scroll down on the page. And over here, the menu is actually giving us the sections on the page. And as we scroll, you can see the vertical scrolling experience. We have the parallax going with the text there and, the, and its transparent panel rising at a different speed than the background image. Um, different sections as we go along, there can be you know, trigger animation effects so the things don't feel dry. Um, using a content carousel, the content carousel is itself, um, again, responsive on a skinnier uh, viewport. Instead of being left, right, horizontal, content in the carousel will actually switch to being vertical. Animation effects, so as we move down, uh, we're triggering different things. Um, interactivity options, things like uh, flip cards or using the vertical accordion menu, and then the visual design aspect of having the, the content background showing through for that visual emphasis there. Another um, opportunity here, we have a number set of uh, what we call components. So they're the tab sets and those sorts of things um, pre-made, very easy to work with. In the case of um, this timeline component, if you make the page skinnier, it becomes left aligned instead of being centered, making, again, a better experience for someone to try to interpret the information as they scroll down the page. Down to uh, a practice exercise, feedback, et cetera, and then a panel at the bottom saying, hey, this is all done. And you can see our counter now is at the uh, counter for, or sorry, we've counted down through all eight of the, uh, eight of the sections on the page. Um, one of the things, though, that uh, for myself, as well as our, our company at large, when we started working with and thinking about and experiencing and playing with Flow as a, as a responsive authoring option was a recognition that we could make a lot of things then that aren't necessarily traditional e-learning anymore. Um, so using responsive design to create uh, a searchable knowledge base, being able to support people now um, with content that's not in the SCORM package in the LMS, but existing somewhere else where people can come in. They can use the front page here to navigate to content, um, or they can do a quick search on a topic. Oh, target pages, that's what I wanted to learn about. And they can go and find the content and information that they need. And the next thing they wanna do, they're gonna go back and do another search, et cetera. So um, a lot of flexibility then. Uh, we're not necessarily thinking about courses anymore. We can think about all kinds of other uh, learning content types to be able to support those. Um, even things like infographics, so using the vertical scrolling to help tell people a story initially about optimizing their, their pages, um, the, 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 you know, the purpose of it, using a video to um, help them understand why it's important, uh, a few reinforcement points here, a bit of proof uh, of what can be different, and then ending that here uh, with a set of lessons then on exactly how to then carry out the types of optimization steps that we would suggest in a variety of different uh, editing tools, you know, our own tool or our Windows editor or Photoshop, et cetera. So telling the story of why something is important and then also giving people the actual steps to be able to make a difference uh, in this particular case. Um, and then one last sample uh, to show, and this is a bit of a marketing piece more than uh, pure e-learning-ish, but uh, the idea of a comic strip. And it's a great, great, great illustration of that fluid grid, right? We've got the, 
the boxes of shapes. And uh, as you scroll down, we're, we're finding out the story. We're tracking through that visually. Um, but we can actually have that content when we get it skinny enough. Boom. Now, so instead of being double columned and left and right, um, everything's been adapted to, to basically a single column uh, for the story. So the learner can, uh, the user can actually experience it much better on a, uh, on a skinnier device. All right, so for what we found was that we were able to start thinking about making other kinds of learning content beyond just something uh, that we would have called a course and just simply published only as a SCORM package, being able to support people with um, more informal learning opportunities um, or just in time learning opportunities, or even moving towards uh, the idea of being able to do more performance support related content. So. I, I talked about my own experience uh, of, of having to learn to think differently. So, so starting to work in responsive design um, does bring, for those of us who are versed in PowerPoint and PowerPoint related tools, there's some challenges that we're going to, to find in thinking differently. Um, if you come from a web design background, uh, especially if you've been to, web, uh, to school for that in the last decade, you already know it. And that's what we find is that uh, the teams that have that kind of background, you go, well, no, this is the way the, web inter inter this is the, way the interwebs works. And, uh, and that only makes sense that our content works this way. But those of us who came up in you know, the PowerPoint world or tools that are derived from PowerPoint or related to PowerPoint, that idea of the box and the layers, designing the content, thinking about how to even plan for it, it's a different way of thinking. I sometimes describe it as like learning a second language because there's a different grammar structure that's going to be the thing that's going to help us give meaning uh, and design to the content that we're making. So you do end up thinking differently. You have an urge in PowerPoint or those type of tools sometimes to just wiggle something over a little bit. Um, but the idea in responsive design is that things don't have a specific location. They've got a relational location. They're going to be here in these circumstances, or they could be here in a different set of circumstances. So instead of trying to design things that are pixel perfect, you design things that have flexibility instead. And so the sense of one of the things that I experienced anyway was having recognizing that I had to give up the sense of the amount of control that I wanted in order to actually let responsive design take advantage or take care of making the types of changes that it needed to have. Um, it could also be a challenge to think a, a little bit more simply, especially to start with. Um, but simplest, simplicity is far more flexible than, than something highly complex, for example. Um, and there is going to be an increase in development time, particularly just QA. You're going to make sure that you're going to QA with multiple devices to make sure that the thing you've made actually does what you expect it to do uh, for, for different learners uh, as they hit it with different devices. You'll also see probably a change in the development process. The web design world changed how it made things. It went from making perfect pixel perfect designs in Photoshop and saying to the web team, here's what you're making, make it exactly like this, um, we thought of everything first, to something that's more iterative um, and a lot more flexible in, in its process. So um, making something, maybe even making a small version of it, testing it with a group of people, making sure that that's a good thing, uh, good way to deal with it, and then moving on to the next small piece, for example. Um, what you find is that there's less of a sense of this is a storyboard and it's the absolute blueprint for what we're going to make. Okay, hand it off to these people and make it, to more of a uh, connection between the two of, okay, here's the content information that we need. Now we're going to prototype in the tool different ways that we can display it and come to the, uh, what we want to display as the best way of doing it, so based on working more within the tool at an earlier stage. Even though there's challenges, there are lots of benefits. Um, the fact that you are making one page and, and it can change and adapt means that you're not making five pages and trying to then edit and update them every time there's something that, uh, you know, even a one word or a factual change or an image change. Um, you're reducing your long-term costs, your long-term labor uh, and effort, et cetera. You also have a, a continuous experience. Uh, you're publishing one SCORM package. So if the LMS is supportive of this and someone starts something on their desktop and decides that they're going to go home and on the couch finish it on their, on their iPad or even their smartphone, um, it's the exact same SCORM package. So from a tracking perspective, um, 
the exact same completion data and, and test scores and everything are all you know aligned the same way in your LMS. Um, and the learner is going to start right off where they left off, even if they're switching devices and logging in differently. Responsive design is also the best way to future-proof your content. Um, we don't know the next sizes of screens that are going to come out, but the way that responsive design works is it's built in to be able to accommodate for all uh, things that, uh, that might come up. Some other benefits. It really opens up a whole new design vocabulary. If you've been you know, on the internet and you said, wow, that looks really nice, it's probably something that's a product of, of the switch to responsive web design. So there's lots of design things that, uh, that we can take advantage of as new ways of presenting information, new experiences, bringing scrolling into the activity of someone consuming content the way that the rest of the internet does. Um, it's also a lot of opportunity to create content that can be used for more than just an e-learning course. You're not just uh, making things in a box anymore that have to be launched. Um, you really can make content that can be used for both formal learning um, and then even portions of it be used later for, for informal learning. Um, informal learning probably will have a higher percentage of people uh, using a, a mobile device, for instance, or whatever device is handy to look up something, and your content will be pre-made already to be able to adapt and change to that. So. So we come to the, the question then, you know, is responsive design or not? Do we have to do this? Do we, um, can we just stick with what we're, what we're currently doing? Um, and I get asked that a lot. I mean, our own authoring platform, we offer both ways of making content. Claro is our way of making content in a traditional e-learning fashion. Flow is our way of making content for a responsive design approach. We can offer people with, you know, both options. Um, they're all HTML5, so they all ultimately do work on mobile devices. Um, so why would you use one and not the other? Uh, do you need to change? Do you, um, um, do you feel that you need to start thinking about this direction or not? So um, let me throw, take a pause there. I've been doing a lot of talking, and uh, let's take a pause and maybe see if anybody offers any ideas around this um, in the questions format there and see if anybody yeah, there's a about There's this. been a couple of questions that have come up over time. Um, one one person points out that responsive is is kind of a boon for those with vision issues, um, or uh, or other other disabilities. Have, how would you face uh, trying to be ADA compliant uh, with with responsive moving forward this way? Right. Oh, so um, actually, responsive design is actually way better for folks who are using um, screen readers or keyboard navigation because the Fluid Grid itself actually sets up the tab order brilliantly. It's, it's baked in basically the, uh, to the page design. Whereas in a, like working in our own Claro, you've then got to figure out and think more about if someone's pushing the tab key to advance to the next hunk of content, what it is, you've actually got to modify the page to, to be able to do that. And it's the same with other tools. Um, so responsive design by default is already much more friendly and accessible for uh, people who are using either screen readers or using keyboards to, to tab through content. It's, it almost solves that problem by, by default, by the the very nature of its page structure. Wonderful. So, so something that is commonly brought up in our webinars, uh, people are we we are as a society are trying to become more and more uh, accessible, and so headed into responsive is a great, great way to uh, mm -hmm. to head into that direction. Another thought, though, talking about other tools like Storyline or Captivate, um, as we are trying to be more responsive. Um, is it more of a matter of trial and error every time, or can we uh, kind of easily, is there a way to easily develop a, a pattern that we can follow as we move forward and, and try to be more responsive? Yeah. Um, well, those two tools do, um, they do responsive differently. Uh, in Captivate, you do actually end up creating multiple versions of a page and modifying it, and it will pick which version of a page to display. So not a true responsive approach um, in that way. And, and Storyline uh, in its nature is pixel perfect. It's building box content in a frame, kind of like working in a movie, the same as our Claro authoring option. Um, and it can be bigger and smaller on, on different screens. Uh, but working in Storyline is not actually uh, technically a responsive. You're still building in the exact same frame dimensions that you sure. have your original. So, I mean, Storyline does offer its Rise option, which is a responsive tool. Um, but we find uh, that uh, a lot of folks have start there and then realize that they want to do more and go beyond what it can offer. So, All right, great. No other questions at this time. 
Okay, cool. Well, back then to the, you know, it's, do you need to make something responsive uh, or not? Um, and when our clients are saying to us, hey, what should I use? Claro or Flow, for example, in our own, in our own product suite. Um, we, we have them think about a couple of things. I mean, um, what are the things that, uh, what, what are some of the contexts that people are going to use? And what's the context of the content that you're actually going to try to create? Um, if you know for sure that all your learners are going to still be at their laptop or a desktop computer, and that's the way that they're going to be uh, accessing your content for now and uh, you know, the foreseeable future, um, well then, yeah, you probably don't need to be thinking about responsive design. You can continue to work in, uh, you know, something comes out of the PowerPoint world with a fixed box frame kind of size to the page or set, up set dimensions, etc. Um, but as people expect to or are able to more and more access the content that you need to create using a mobile device, it, that really becomes a, a, the, the first argument or the first, uh, the first reason, the practicality uh, of just being able to present content in a better or more optimized way uh, across multiple devices. Sometimes though, the content itself though, doesn't really, isn't really suitable to something that might morph or change. I've got one last quick example to, to share to help explain what I'm talking about. So um, here's a game uh, situation, uh, an escape room kind of game and And it's, it's not made in our, it's not made in flow, it's made in our Claro authoring op uh, option because for something like a game or this kind of uh, experiential thing, we really do require the frame. Um, we can't move things around because part of the experience of this is, is that things are actually in their specific location. So um, there are some content types that, um, you know, aren't going to be easily turned into something responsive uh, where you are, you know, in this case, we're working in a world that's representing sort of the three dimensionality of the, the large world around us by working in a, uh, by being in a room. So, um, so there are still some content types where it does make sense to be uh, working in a, a non-responsive mode as well. So, uh, but what we're finding um, more and more uh, as time goes by is more and more of our content teams uh, really are making the, just the full on switch. And they're saying, you know what? We don't know what the future holds. We know that we need to provide uh, content to, that people can access across different devices. We want it to be future-proof, et cetera. And then we're seeing more and more of our more of our more of our client base switching over to using the, the responsive design option that Flow gives them, um, even though they might have a, 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 a you know a comfort level or an experience level in that non-responsive world. So, all right. So, I mean, we've done some questions. Andrew, I don't know if there's any more questions that have uh, that have shown up or not at this point in time. Uh, no new ones that I'm seeing. If you guys have any last minute questions, now's the time to uh, type those into the questions panel. Cool. And while they're thinking on that, we'll pop up to the last slide. Um, if you're interested at all, at all in understanding or thinking about or learning about what, we, uh, what we've been talking about here today, we do offer for our own tool set a, a free 14-day uh, trial, www.domino.com. Um, and also don't forget the, uh, the opportunities that uh, the E-Learning Brothers team offers as well with their seven-day trial um, as well. Um, you know, when it comes to working with assets and content pieces like that, totally works uh, in, in, in a responsive design model um, as well. Uh, in fact, some, you know, responsive design makes really awesome use of particularly a lot of things like background images, et cetera, so. And we've got hundreds of thousands of assets when it comes to icons or cutout people or stock footage, stock assets, things like that. Our customizable courseware team is developing uh, more courses right now, and we're developing them in Domino's tool, Domino Flow. So, uh, you know, we really like that tool, and, and uh, you can expect to see more uh, responsive courses if you guys are looking for pre-packaged, pre-built, off-the-shelf courses. Uh, well, we've got a ton of those already, but new ones will be coming out, having been developed in Domino Flow. Thank you, Chris. This is great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We hope you were able to uh, learn something new today that will help you in your jobs and in your lives. And we hope you guys have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.